Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, we have David Buckner joining us from Mississippi to talk about some saltwater patterns. And the weekly tip is going to be on wing cases for nymphs. I know that sounds like a really simple um, thing to talk about, but we'll uh, we'll see if uh, anyway we could probably do a whole whole uh, presentation on just wing cases because there's a whole lot can go wrong with them. But anyway, tonight David Buckner is going to be telling us about saltwater. And let me find David's feed and get him add the spotlight. There we go. <clears throat> Are you ready to kick off, my friend? I'll I am. Read, your, read your introduction. All right, let me. Uh... <clears throat> David Buckner is retired and lives in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. He's a leader in the historic Ocean Springs saltwater fly fishing and eastern shore fly fishing clubs. He is also an FFI Gulf Coast Council board member. He discovered fly fishing through his love for baseball. Huh, that basketball. sounds like there might. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> basketball. Oh, I'm sorry. I misread that. Basketball. Anyway, it sounds like there might be a story in that last sentence. David, why don't you tell us about it? And you can correct uh, whatever I said wrong there. <laughs> That's all. It is the end of baseball season. So we'll take it. But it, it's an honor to present tonight. Um but Gretchen and Al, thanks for, for, for allowing me to present and, and really appreciate what y'all do and and the access that, that all of us have to each other. And I know I consider a lot of y'all fly tying royalty and appreciate the, the learnings that I've gotten in the, the year long uh, time I've spent with you. But, but it, it's, it's really good to be part of the group and appreciate what Gretchen and Al do for us. Um, I want to start by, by talking about how I got into fly time because it's a real, I think a really cool story. Does anybody know who this guy is? Denny Crum. Awesome. Uh, great guest. And um, U.S. UCLA assistant coach, too. I'm sorry? He was UCLA assistant coach also. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Um, Coach Denny Crum, he, he played at UCLA and was an assistant to John Wooden, um, involved in recruiting Bill Walton, went to Louisville for a 30-year career, a Hall of Fame coach, two national championships. Uh, Denny's currently, or I should call him coach, is currently 85 years old. But through my high school and college basketball experience, um, and it's it's kind of there's a community there on the college basketball side that's similar to the fly tying side. Um, a lot of great relationships are built over time, and I know with AAU, AAU basketball now, um, a lot of interaction among players and coaches and such. And it was a little bit like that back when I was playing, but but got to know coach and um, a few other guys, and back in probably. 15, 20 years ago, um, he started hosting us for fly fishing. Uh, he has a, a home. Show you some more pictures. His, his nickname was Cool Hand Luke, and that's his, <laughs> that's his home in Allen Park, Idaho. Oh, and that's wow. a look out, out his back window at the lake right. there. We've seen that, haven't we? And, and these are, are pictures with Coach um, cool. on trips we took. But it was a, an awesome experience. He told, told the story about how he got into fly fishing. And I don't know if we're, we went the same route every time. And the, there were five of us and coach treated us like a team. And if we weren't in the, in the truck on time, he'd leave us. Um, just real, real discipline. Uh, again, we went the same direction every year we went. And he would take us through, I think it was West Yellowstone, where they were doing a coaching clinic one year that he was a part of. And they asked him if he wanted to try casting. And he volunteered and got up there and started casting and um, ended up falling in love with the sport. Bought a place in Idaho. He lives in Louisville. Um, bought a place in Idaho and, and goes out there several weeks a year. Uh, coach had a couple of minor strokes in his early 80s, 
Um, so, so we haven't gone in several years, but it was a really grand time, a great time to talk about basketball. He talked about, um, I've, I've been there when he was, um, when he was doing his radio show, um, he talked about the, the recruiting days, um, and interesting thing there is he did all the recruiting. Uh, John Wooden didn't go on the road. The only player that Wooden recruited was Bill Walton. But um, the stories were just amazing and, and great time. And, and that was my, my introduction into fly fishing. Um, moving to the coast, um, it's become more of a, a saltwater venture. And I want to talk tonight about Pompano in particular. And I've got there a phrase match the species. Um, whereas trout fishermen, and we'll talk about warm water too, because it's kind of on a continuum from fresh water matching the, the hatch to salt water matching the species. Um, when I sit down to tie flies, uh, I typically tie flies specific for, for what I'm targeting, whether it's redfish, um, cobia, for instance, I'll, I'll tie an orange double bunny for cobia, a uh, triple tail. I'll tie shrimp flies uh, and small minnows, sheep's head. We've got a, a similar to a, a, um, a gotcha fly, a, a crazy Charlie fly that, 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 we, that we tie, speckled trout. But there are specific flies for specific species. Now you might run across you know, crab or shrimp or, or, or a bait fish, maybe a red minnow, or a silver side and decide to throw those. But typically we're tying for the species. Al mentioned it last week. This, this is a, a satellite view of the Louisiana from, from the Mississippi, mouth of the Mississippi over to the panhandle of Florida. And you see Mobile Bay in the middle. And one of the issues we deal with down on the Mississippi Gulf Coast is mud, uh, dirty water. And you can see that on the left. If we have a north wind, um, it, if we have uh, lack of rain, um, if they open the Bonnie Carey spillway um, over towards New Orleans uh, to release water, we're dealing with mud. And you've got to find those clear days like are on the right. You see, um, over towards the left at the mouth of, mouth of the Mississippi, you see that kind of comma-shaped island. That's Chandelure Island. Oh, yeah. And, and we spend a lot of time down there. On the right-hand side, that's a good day. <clears throat> um, that's a good day for the barrier islands. Another issue we have is those barrier islands, they suppress the wave action. So we don't get a lot of water movement inshore in Mississippi. So we have to go to the east, and we'll go over to, to Dolphin Island in Alabama, just east of Mobile Bay, all the way over on the Panhandle, uh, Pensacola, uh, Fort Walton, Panama City, places like that, Destin, to, to fish for, for surf fishing um, on the beach. And uh, it's just a, it's a whole different game. Of course, we're looking at, at other other type of forecast, we're looking at, at waves, um, tides, wind, salinity, things like that. But, but that's what we're dealing with. So we'll check that before we, before we go out and it really guides what we do as far as trips. Um, what I wanted to, to get into again is Pompano. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever fished for Pompano, but I've got several um, bullets here about how to and, and, and what to use. Uh, we sight fish for pompano in the surf and typically a, a, a kind of shallow surf. So you're able to walk out uh, maybe knee deep into the water. We fish typically late spring to summer, uh, starting in April, May time frame when the water is 70 degrees plus. Mainly range in size from 12 to 18 inches. In Florida, there's a, a fork limit of 11 inches and a uh, creel limit of six. 
We typically use a, an eight weight. You can use a nine weight rod and um, typically use a, a sinking line, an intermediate line as well. Six foot, 20, 20 pound tapered leader is typically what we're using. As you fish for these guys, you're looking for flashes. And we typically fish from about 10 o'clock to, to two o'clock in the afternoon when the sun's directly overhead. And you can really see the, the mirror flashes from the fish. We fish the bottom typically. And um, I'll show you tonight, we'll talk about four flies and they're all heavily weighted. Um, not a bad thing because when you can see that picture on the left, the bottom picture of the fish on the bottom, um, you can stir up little dust of sand with those weighted flies as you, as you strip the flies in. And um, you're gonna strip fairly fast. Um, start out slow and like I said, try to dust up some sand, but then start stripping hard. You're gonna strip set the fish, not trout set, which um, may even give you another opportunity to catch the fish because you're not gonna pull the, the line out of the water. But also with, with these fish, which are, which are um, compressive form shaped or flat fish, uh, you're gonna follow the fish uh, with the rod tip. So as you, as you fight the fish, you're gonna go with the fish versus a red fish where you pull against the fish and you're trying to wear the fish out. So a little bit different than other fish. We do the same thing with, with jacks, same, same method as far as landing them. Any questions there, comments? Anybody got any input? Yeah, we've got a question here from, uh, from Aaron Cully. Are your leaders stout on the butt section for the heavily weighted flies? Typically, I, I'm buying the, the shorter um, package tapered leaders. So they're, they're tapered and, and, and the tips, it's a 20 pound, that's what I buy. So it's tapered down to the, the tip. I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it is heavier, you know, where, you, where you're gonna loop it into your fly line. You use fluorocarbon rather than mono. I typically use mono, but, but, but either one's gonna work. They, you know, if we're, we're tying flies for these guys, they're typically medium to large dumbbell, lead dumbbell eyes, or a good bit of, of lead wire. So what I want to do is, is talk about two flies, which are more crafting than fly tying, and then tie two flies. Uh, starting off, and, and I think there's something here for, for everybody. The point I want to make on, on this, this is a sand flea or a mole crab. You see the picture on the left, and you see the flies tied above it. Over on the right hand side, you can see the, uh, the materials. You can see rubber legs, dubbing, typically using mono thread, lead wire, using a number two uh, mustad hook. That's a, that's a DT model, but we typically use an um, 34007 model. You've got on the left hand side, you've got daddy long legs and, and crystal flash and chenille, which is, which is cut and with burned ends. What I've got there in the middle is a, a River Road Creations cutter. I think we talked about that not too long ago. A call, Tim Flagler was talking about the, the, the cut through foam. Now, now with furry foam, it's a, it's a tough cut, much tougher than just straight foam, a two millimeter foam. But I designed that, that custom cutter Sent it to, to Tony at River Road Creations. Those folks are great to work with. And he made that, that cutter in about two weeks. What I'll do with that guy is I'll take a bodkin and burn a hole in the middle and fold it over the hook and tie it down in the front. So under the hook, there's a, there's a good bit of, of, of wire that I flatten. And now I'm going to move over to the, the vise real quick and I want to show y'all that this, this is the, that's the drawing that I sent to Tony. So I just gave him the dimensions and the shape. And like I said, it took him about two weeks. He said it was a pretty tough, pretty tough cutter to make compared to the others he does. 
and against my hand, you'll see the, the, the cutter and you can kind of tell how large it is. Huh. I can't recall the exact amount I paid, but it was only about 75 bucks, which is not bad considering the, the amount of effort he put into that. Any questions about that guy? That's the sand flea. Very effective with Pompano. Next one I want to show you is a ghost shrimp. Really interesting looking shrimp that, that, that's different than, than other glass shrimp and other shrimp we fish with. Uh, you can see some pictures on the bottom left and, and bottom middle. That bottom middle picture is incredible. Those things get up to four or five inches long. Uh, really a strange creature. That fly is tied with, with a good bit of, of rabbit fur. And I stack that rabbit fur all the way to the back. And it's, it's actually um, underside and the top. And then finish it off with a, with a Merkin style tail with EP fiber. That's a, a 4X hook. I'll use the, the really long, a one to a, a two alt size, a 4X mustad hook, saltwater hook. Really effective fly too. It's got a good bit of uh, wire, lead wire around the, the hook shank as well to, to help it sink. But that one's got a lot of action in the water. Love the, um, the ghost shrimp. The first fly we want to look at at the vise is a pompano rocket. I don't know if you, you guys have, have heard of Baz Yelverton. Baz lives in Pensacola and he created uh, this fly specifically for pompano. Um, and it's a real, real easy fly to tie. Um, the fellow that taught me to tie this fly is named Jim McGee, lives in Ocean Springs. And, and his comment was, you can't out bling a pompano. You can't out bling a pompano. So you'll see with this fly, and the, the next one, which is my version of Pompano Rocket, a lot of, a lot of flash involved with that Mylar. So what we've got is a, a number two, a short shank hook, Yamagatsu. We've got uh, brass dumbbell eyes, gold Mylar, and that's the medium size. And then a, I use a fluorescent yellow bucktail. And we'll use a, one of the other things I want to talk about at the vice is, is um, UV resin, but use a good bit of UV resin with these guys. We'll, we'll load them up. But again, a, a really, really easy one to tie. But this is exactly uh, the recipe from Baz. Total length about two and three quarters inches is what he aims for. Um, the mylar that's cut there is cut at a, an inch and a half. So we'll start out. I've got... 0.004 uh, mono is what I'm using with this fly. And we'll start out with dumbbell eyes up front. And you're going to tie this guy just like you would tie a, um, a clouser, deep minnow, on one side, <clears throat> just the underside. One of the things I use a lot because I tie with a lot of bucktail, I made this this prepper holder. It's just six millimeter foam in a T and I cut some slots. Uh, this thing's probably six, eight years old. <laughs> Come to find out now hairline sells one. I think blame chocolate pedals the thing. And, and I don't know how much it costs, but I could have made at least a hundred bucks on this idea. Really handy if you use a lot of bucktail and real handy if you, if you have leftovers you want to, to save. So I'll start out by cutting the bucktail in a little bit of a, a uh, slant and tie it in on the near side of the hook. And what I want to do is just get this guy bound down very lightly behind the hook. You don't want a lot of pressure because you don't want it flaring. Whoops. I'm going to take the, the mylar and pull out the, um, the core. And what I want to do with this mylar is fold it, first of all, like so. And then I want to get in there on that inside and run my bodkin through there. 
and work it around a little bit so that you get enough clearance to then push it over the hook. And you got to be real careful with that mylar because sometimes you'll catch one of the strands. You want to get that mylar on the, on the eye of the hook like that. And all you're going to do is push it back. Tie that guy in behind the hook. What we're going to do is just fray out the, the mylar. I'm going to tie that guy off. And I use an awful lot of UV resin. My primary kind, I don't know if you can see that, is Silver Creek Crystal Flex. Also use a, a, a high-powered flashlight. As I mentioned, I use a, a whole lot of resin. I'm going to drive Al crazy with this. The resin is going to give you a good bit of uh, durability as well. And then we'll cure that. And that's the Pompano rocket. That's Baz Yelverton's design for the rocket. The, the next one we've got is, is kind of a design I came up with. A um, little bit different. This one's using, a, again, a, a number two. It's using a Mustad 34007 with medium dumbbell eyes. I use a flat diamond braid and chartreuse and then red and then a, a medium mylar cord. So, so this one's a little bit different. Um, similar uh, style, but a little bit different. Good bit more um, UV and good bit more durability. You don't have the bucktail. This one requires about two and three quarter inch uh, mylar. The resin I, I mentioned earlier, I buy from a fella in Wisconsin. It's about 16 bucks a bottle. And it, if anybody needs the, the contact, be glad to give it to them. But it dries incredibly well, cures incredibly well. Um, no tackiness at all. And while you're doing that, we've got a couple of questions here. Fred Dupre comments, the fly looks like a Charlie Seipert minnow. And Barry Webster thought it did to him as well. I've never heard of that one. That's interesting. This guy, you can use any color dumbbell eyes, um, any color mylar. You're just trying to really get the, the uh, flash. And on this fly, we're going to go about a half of a, a hook, hook eye behind the eye with the dumbbell eyes. You want them pretty, pretty far forward. We're going to go all the way back to the, the bend and then back forward again and, and trying on this one to, to build up a, a tad of bulk. And you'll see why as we move forward. We're going to tie in that, that flat diamond braid in, in chartreuse to start. And don't worry too much about the, the front and leaving that, that fray braid up there because it's all going to be covered up at the end. We turn that forward. We're going to wrap this, wrap the chartreuse about two thirds of the way forward and tie it down. And then we're going to tie in a, uh, a red braid ahead of that and simulate gills here. On this guy, the red, you want to overlap a good bit because again, you wanna, you'll see why we wanna build up bolt towards the, the front of the fly.
We'll tie this guy off in the front. What we want to do at this point is, is we're going to go all the way back to the, the back. Tie in our mono. On this fly, I'm using silver mylar. Again, I'm going to pull out that, that center cord. This one's a tad different. I'm going to, going to fold it in half again and put the, the bodkin number two hooks. Have a little bit larger eye. So what I'm going to do is run my scissors through that mylar, like so, to expand it a little bit more, fit over the eye of the hook. Put that guy on there. And again, fold it back. Tie it in. Lock it down. This guy, you're going to do the, the same thing with as far as the mile are. You're going to pray it out with your bodkin. Like so. This one we're going to, again, load up with, with UV resin. Always like to cover my eyes, dumbbell eyes, with resin because I'm typically fishing on, on oyster beds and sand. And if you don't, they'll, just, they'll wear out in no time, that paint. You'll lose your paint, lose your color. Again, a real good coat. We've already covered that, that braid, which really makes the, the colors pop. You might be able to see some of that, that fluorescence in the, the eyes and the, the braid. Mm -hmm. That's the, the second Pompano rocket. And I'd like to show y'all another one, uh, another option with, with this guy, and it really makes it indestructible. I don't know if you can see it, but with this one, I actually filled in the, um, the center there around the braid with resin. So this one is solid. Nearly indestructible. So those are, are two Pompano rockets. Any questions. questions about those guys? Got a couple of them here that are on the um, chat from Joyce. Says, is the silver mylar called cord? And the silver mylar I get is a strand is a strand and she wants it that explained and the other one while you're at it dutch bachman wanted to know if you fished the rocket on other species other than pompano dutch i have never fished the rocket to target other species i'm sure you could tie a rocket that the redfish would go crazy about especially tying these with the dumbbell eyes where the hook rides up and um if you had some i've got some copper mylar tubing uh that would just be awesome for, for redfish, uh, potentially with some red eyes or, or even gold eyes would make a great redfish fly. Could you show us the uh, UV resin bottle so we can see the label on it? I could share with you the, the uh, guy I buy it from. It's, again, it's Silver Creek, and the guy only sells it via the web and email, and I pay him through PayPal. So it's not readily available at stores. It fly shop. The um the mylar I, I like to use on this one is a size medium. 
and, and I buy the Madison River mylar. You can see it there. Watch and I buy it in silver and gold and copper and black. I, and, and they also, I, I believe, have pearl color. But Madison River Fishing Company and free shipping. So you can just order a couple of bags and they're really good to deal with. A lot of the other mylar from, from other folks, if you order the, they'll have a medium and large and the medium's just huge compared. Any other questions about the, the flies? I want to show you some others that, that I use. And, and these are some squid patterns. Uh, these are tied with a, uh, a body tubing. And y'all probably noticed those tentacles. Those are those um, mini squiggly squiggle worms that folks use for, for San Juan worms and such. I use a bit of flexo crabs and, and an EP crab. That's another another squid. Uh, tie a good bit of shrimp. Always use Steve Farrar on top, but but that's got an EP body. Bunny flies. I, I love using rabbit for uh, flies, especially minnows. Uh, some, some other minnows there. These guys right here on the, the Mississippi Gulf Coast over to Florida, these colors seem to be golden for us. Fluorescent yellow and fluorescent red, and you see some different variations. <clears throat> This clouser down here we call a firefly. Really does well with speckled trout, but uh, specifically we use gold brass eyes with uh, fluorescent yellow and fluorescent red above. Anybody got a guess of what that looks like? What fly does that look like? It reminds me of a, a um, Mickey Finn. Mickey Finn. Uh, yeah. and, and there's just there's just something about those colors down here in the salt water that, that do us well. Another really good color, kind of, kind of off topic, is is um, especially with redfish and trout, is olive green, uh, solid olive green clouser with red crystal flash and red dumbbell eyes. Just seems to be automatic. We call that a chandelier special. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I've got a, got a couple of questions here uh, from Rick. Silver Creek is on the fly tying forum. And what is the body material for the squid is what Fred Dupre is asking. Fred, if, if, if you look at this one right here is, is articulate. It's a, um, but these are not. But I typically tie on a, a long uh, shank hook. And I will, I will, this one's made one of those fish skull heads as a base for the head. And I'll fold over the um the plastic body tubing the the, uh, the clear uh, the type of body tubing you would make a um, flexo crab out of but and I think it it's I believe it's one quarter or three eighths inch but I will fold that over tie it down and fold it back over that skull head that plastic head and tie it mm -hmm. down and then I'll connect it to that that shank that's a um actually I think a sixty degree shank I'll do the same thing there. I will tie it down and pull it back. Um, some of those like that one there in that picture has two layers of body tubing. It's got a plastic like the flexo tubing except in clear. And then it's got that um, the pearl, that really um, thin pearl body tubing on top of it. I can text you or um, email you those, those specifics, but... I've been real, real lucky with those those squid. That that tail that's on there, I cut the shape out of a milk carton and I cover it. That one there is covered with that body tubing. And then those those squiggle worms at the front, I, I can't recall who makes them. Yeah, Hairline makes those guys because I actually called them and asked them if they could make a larger one for me because I'd like to have and um, I'd love to make a, a three four alt squid that I could fish cobia with. But that, that one's got, because it's it's got that, um, some of those parts like the head are hollow, I put a good bit of weight on the hook on those guys too. A lot um, of my fly tying is crafting, y'all. It's like that um, mole crab. Uh, Ron Mayfield is asking, do you change colors based on water clarity? If so, what colors for what water conditions? Yeah, typically our, our colors, you know, if it's going to be a, it's bright fly, bright day, just like trout fishing. And, and we're going to, we're going to fish those, those bottom right flies, those really, really bright flies on a, 
on a clear water day. Um, if it's murky, we're dark flies. We're, we're olive and uh, black and purple do really well in this area would have thought. as well. But it's, it's the same approach as, as you would take with um, cold water. So Al, I've got, so, so one of those flies I really like, it's that, that double bunny and it's got some schlapping on the front and it's got some, uh, some mono, glued mono to uh, dome eyes um, and some crystal flash. But, but Al, I just think this guy would really look cool in the tank. I, I think you're right. And, you know, it looks an awful lot like some of the flies that we, uh, that we fished on the Yellowstone for browns. You know, they're a little bit smaller on the Yellowstone, but still look very similar. Why don't you hand that over here and I'll take a look at it. Sure. Here you go. <laughs> oh, that's good. All right. Yeah, you couldn't fool us last time either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have skeptics on the light. I can tell right now. <laughs> anyway, that does look good. And, and this looks like about a size two, isn't it, David? It is. I'm just getting it kind of hooked up right now. Well, it's got a lot of movement. Yeah, it sure does. You know, and, and one of the things about stripping that fly, you're going to get a lot of movement too. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more. Let's uh, spotlight that for a minute. Robin wants some information on the tank. Um, okay, ask the question and because uh, the, oh. the person that knows about it is David. Yeah, David, uh, Robin would like some information on the swim tank. Do you have his email address? Robin's I believe so. It's in the distribution list. Yeah. Could you send Robin some information on the tank? Certainly. Okay. When David, when you tie a double bunny, do you connect the top and the lower bunnies? Do you glue them together or attach them somehow? On, on that guy there, the... Um, the strip of yellow is not as long as the, the red, but they're glued all the way back to the end of the yellow. And what kind of glue do you use for that, please? Sure looks good. I it? use fabric glue. We need to do something. I use um, we need to go to Hobby Lobby or something. Liquid fusion fabric glue. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've used Softex in the past. That works pretty well. I'll have to try that too. Any more questions for David? I never heard the answer to whether you use a stinger hook on this type of fly versus this just the regular one hook. I typically don't. I'm I kind of grew up and 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 learned time with, with mustad and for salt water. Hooks. I've never had an issue with with thirty four double o sevens and elevens, and and that's just my go to. So you don't get short strikes, as they call them. No, okay. never had any issues with it. Never had any breaks. Nothing. No bends with those uh, mustad. Now sometimes the 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 old stainless steel thirty four double o sevens are are hard to find. Um, but, but that's what I always have used. The weekly tip all the way from saltwater that they're, they're measured in ought and big, big, big flies. We're going to be looking at wing cases on smaller flies. And we've learned one thing about wing cases. We could probably do a whole hour and a half long program on just wing cases because, uh, we've seen, more wing cases that are messed up than anything. I, if they're so easy to mess up, they're so easy to do right. Let me get my other glasses on. I'm actually going to remember to do it tonight. And we'll get over here. And here's a here's a make-believe nymph. All this, all this is is just some stuff I threw on the hook. And I wanted to show you that it's got a wing case 
that's messed up. The wing case is too narrow. Now, that doesn't show up real good. But that wing case started its journey in life as wide as, as a hook gap, one size smaller. You see how it's kind of slendered down? Oh, I, I see an awful lot of... a lot of focus. Let me let me adjust the focus here. We might have bumped something. Yeah, here. I think it's a little loud. But, whoops. There yeah, we that's go. Better. That's better. There we go. Now you can see it better. Yep. Okay. Anyway, so it's a little bit on the narrow side. Let me show you how to fix that. First off, the way this one, the mistake was made on this one, is like a, a lot of people tie their flies. The tail was tied on, the back part of the body, the wing case was tied in. And then they put the lead wire up front, the thorax, pull the wing case over, and you end up uh, with this type of a situation. It's like we always talk about, let me make a switch here. Here's one with the wing case is much wider. As far as we're concerned, it's a properly uh, a proper wing case. And what's the difference? Well, let me show you what the difference is. I want you to notice that on this fly or this partial fly, I'll get it up here so you can see it. There we go. We tied the wing case material to the hook directly in front of the back part of the body. What we did on this hook is built the front part of the body. Well, shoot, let me try. Let me just get this out of here. Put that one in the in the vise. And I want you to notice that the body has been made larger by adding material in front and including the lead wire and all that stuff. And what you end up with is if you'll notice here. So so stop just a minute. So you're tiring on. And there's lead wire underneath where you're tying it on. All the stuff is under it, yeah. it rather than rather than putting the wing case on. As soon as you've tied on the back part of the body, like a lot of folks do, and then they finish the fly to the front. As you finish a good portion of the underbody in front of the wing case and then tie it on so that you're tying to a larger diameter um, body part of body material. And what that does is I want you to notice that it, it's tied all the way down on the side here and on the side here. And that one is going to be a nice wide wing case when we pull it over. In fact, I'll just pull it over temporarily here. here. I'm not gonna bother about putting materials in. And there's one other thing that can make wing cases turn out a lot better. If everything goes to heck and pulling the wing case over, it doesn't work for you. Now that's gonna be a nice wide wing case, as you can see. But there's another thing you can do. Sometimes the salvage of wing cases going to heck on you is lay your bodkin in there, push it over, not pull it over. And that will also spread that out and keep it from collapsing on you. But anyway, that's the tip for tonight. Tie your wing cases on an underbody, not directly to the hook. I guess that would be the that's a good explanation. The, the message. Okay, well, I was working, I was working for it. You're working it. up I know, to it. I know how to do it, Gretchen. <laughs> I just don't know how to explain it.